what we'd like to know is what happens in the brain specifically by doing a brain map as one way, which is what we did, right? A brain map, by doing that pre and post, right? So there are bigger scanners we talked about, which we can find out what's going on. That would be a way, and I think whatever we can use to, to understand more of what's going on before and after, and taking care of that person carefully during their experience. I'm really curious, I mean, there's been a lot of benefits uh, that I've personally received from psychedelics. A lot of my friends, former operators, have received a lot of, I mean, it's just been positive almost all the way around. But I do know of specific examples where psychedelics didn't, I, I, they either did nothing for, I'll just call them the patient, or it was actually harmful. And I have not heard, all I've heard is psychedelics are great. Everybody's doing psychedelics. They're making these massive headway with them. But nobody's talking about the couple of cases. And, and there's got to be more. That's just who I know, yeah. you know. And um, one guy has migraines. He now has migraines on a regular basis. Never had migraines before. Um, and the other two, um, I know three people that did not have a good psychedelic experience. Do you know of any negative side effects from this? I do not, but I'm not, I'm not that engaged in that network of people doing that. Um, you know, and although ketamine is another one that a lot of people are using uh, for be and having benefits, uh, which is not necessarily a psychedelic, but it's another, this, this, in this, this genre, I would say, where we're starting to try to get changes in people's brain utilizing different pharmacologics, uh, traditional medicine, herbal thing, whatever it might be in this area. So we know that there's benefit to many people. Okay, let's just say that. Because I like to say that. What do we know? We know that people are getting benefits. You're one of them. We know that in many of the people, the benefits are longer term. That's remarkable. And, and even this data, because I've, I've seen people ask you like, is there published research on this? Yes, Stanford has published research. I do not, but go search Stanford. You're gonna have to do a little work on your own, little legwork. Stanford is publishing data on the use and the controlled use and the processing with the person. So for me, as just an individual, um, buying something on your own, going out in your backyard and doing it is not the way to be doing things. Because there's so much going on that we, we don't know. I think it's much better in a controlled environment. Vital signs are being maintained. You have people looking out for you, totally focused on your well-being. I think those are the ways people have to consider, if they're considering, how they're going to try that. But So there's many different types, right? There's mushrooms, there's LSD microdosing. And again, I'm not an expert. There's ibogaine, there's all these ayahuasca. Or, um, so... I think that what I've talked with somebody in my field about who's been doing it for more than 40 years, he said, what we'd like to know is what happens in the brain specifically by doing a brain map as one way, which is what we did, right? A brain map by doing that pre and post, right? So there are bigger scanners we talked about, which we can find out what's going on. That would be a way. And I think whatever we can use to, to understand more of what's going on before and after and taking care of that person carefully during their experience and helping them process it. So I'll, I'll just, I'll open this up. So, I mean, I grew up in South Florida and I was a teenager and I did things. And my son said, dad, when you did that, didn't you have like breakthroughs and experiences? And I said, no, I didn't. Why not? Because I was just a foolish young kid doing that. So I didn't have breakthroughs and great visions and. It was just foolishness on my side. That's not what I'm recommending. So if someone's gonna do it and they're being cared for by a group like the, the group that you were working with, I mean, I thought that was brilliant. I think those men and women are really like, okay, let's, let's do the right thing for these people. Let's, I think there's a lot there that we need to, to look into and continue to research, get data on so that we can better help people, even, even identify those before they do it that mm, this may not work well for you. This may not be your best option. Because certainly in my mind, it's not like, oh, you're a special operator, you need to do psychedelics. That's not the, I don't think that. I think this may be a great option for you. And so let's get some data and let's build up what we call a phenotype, 
which types respond best to these types of interventions and which do not. And we can gather that kind of data, especially even now with coming AI, and that's a whole nother topic, but um, understanding who's gonna be the best fit for that therapy, I think would be the next level of how to deliver the psychedelics in a very successful way for people so they can get the best out of that if they choose it. Have you ever heard the way it was described to me, which is probably completely off after listening to you, is it does interrupt the default mode network, but the way I understood it is the default mode network kind of gets lazy after time, and it's just a highway of neurons going back and forth. And what I've heard is the psychedelics will throw a roadblock up, and then those neurons have to find new pathways or, or reopen old pathways, which is, is there any truth a, to that? See, that's a great statement. So I would say, okay, let's look at data. How can we determine if we have new pathways? Well, if you did something uh, like a tractography, like on the front of this kind of National Geographic, this is tractography. Now we can see, are we generating new pathways? Or we could look at a QEEG, like I showed you, and we can say, what was the connectivity before? And what is the connectivity? So I'll, I'll explain this when we talk about your map, is we can look at how these areas, all those points on the cap, represent different areas of the brain, and how they're talking to each other. And so we can have hyper-connectivity, too much. It'd be like me standing next to you, like yelling in your ear. Your brain can just be screaming away. Or it can be hypo-connectivity, -connecti which is like it's not communicating very well at all between networks. Okay. And so then the question is, what did it do? Is it developing new synapses? I don't know about that. It might be. What is a synapsis? Synapsis connection, basically, and I'm going to just make things simple. Connection between two neurons. Okay. They synapse. But there's around 80 billion neurons in your brain, and there's three times to 10 times the amount of synapses. So they connect all over each other. So if we're developing new highways, we're talking neuroplasticity. Okay. Right? So do, do psychedelics create neuroplasticity? I think you probably have people on both sides of the aisle for that. Really? Interesting. Does, do psychedelics benefit many people? Yes. Is it for everyone? Probably not. Let's determine who's gonna benefit the most from it. That's, where I, that's the camp I land in, because it's not my expertise, but I'm open if it can help people, and does it create neuroplasticity? That's for the neuroscientists to determine based on data, right? You always have to have good intel. Is that the right language? It is. If you have poor intel, it doesn't go well. So if you have poor data, you can make all kinds of assumptions, but my dad would say it another way, which I won't. You're talking out of your south end. <laughs> <laughs> my dad had some colorful expressions. So, you know, we have to have good data about the brain going in, doing it, coming out, so we can then correlate that and say, what does this mean, really? Because we say a lot of things, and I've learned from my wife, words are very important the way we say things. And I've learned in my years now, and I probably shouldn't have said it that way. So I'm hopefully I'm choosing my words carefully to help people listening is that, you know, there's benefit. You need to look into it. You need to find reputable people. You need to really, you know, cross your T's and dot your I's and, you know, really go into that like, okay, let me see if this is the right therapy for me. Because in a big metropolitan area like we live in, there's businesses. You know what I mean? So. Mm -hmm. You know, great, sign you up, great, sign you up. And so we just have to be wise in how we're looking at that. But it's definitely has promise for a lot of people. Okay. Psychedelics, wanna, check. <laughs> yeah, I want to get into the mapping of my brain after the break here. But before, since we're on kind of these um, non-traditional treatments, I'd like to ask you about marijuana. And the reason I'm asking is because I've used marijuana. It helped a lot with my anxiety. It's helped with sleep. It's helped with my overall mood. I, I never even considered it until my mid thirties. And the first time I did it, both nights sleep, anxiety, mm. very low, if at all. And, um, and it, it did improve my overall mood. So now I've heard that there are negative effects to that as well, but I, I just like to, get your opinion on 
what's happening there. Yeah, I mean, it definitely it's an area again that I don't just I'm not I don't work in dispensing that. Um, you know, I grew up in South Florida during the age when all that stuff was happening. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mean, meaning drugs and influx and all that stuff. Not that I was involved in that, but you know, I grew up in the midst of that. So, you know, that kind of tainted a lot of my experiences mm -hmm. back then. So we, again, what do we know? We know that whether it's CBD or whether it's uh, oral consumption, you know, or whether it's smoking, we know that uh, there's benefit. We know there's benefit. What is it doing to the brain? That's where I always land, right? Mm -hmm. We know that it changes certain brainwave states. We also know that it can decrease motivation in younger men and, and the chronic use of it or the daily use of it. So we might be trying to get to something. So am I for it or against it? I think people have to make that decision. I think there's benefits and you have to see if that's the right mechanism for you to use or right therapeutic mm -hmm. to help you. And then be judicious enough where everything is being thrown at us in society, like do anything, take anything, is to understand first, what's going on in my brain? And is that the best option for me? I think that's very important. So I'm not so old fashioned that I would say, oh, we can't do any of that. Listen, there's benefits and we're learning each day. Everything is advancing, uh, you know, it's becoming more sophisticated, the raising of it, the growing of it, the processing of marijuana and the use of it. Uh, I just like the more judicious use of it and the understanding of what's going on in the person's brain prior to whatever therapeutic they choose. Because if you don't know, okay, so it benefited you. I sleep better, I have less anxiety. Okay, are you, is your tolerance gonna go up? Are you gonna have to smoke more? How much is that gonna cost you? What else is that gonna do to your brain? What is it gonna do to you long-term? Those are the questions that I'm also interested in. We need the short-term help for people, just like a medication. But we also need to understand more the long-term. And can we get that person's brain to change on its own neuroplastically that they may not need that? Hmm. Because the brain, we are so early in neuroscience right now, so early. Like probably what we're talking about now in, in five, three to five years will be like, we were doing that? So I think you're gonna see such a radical change in the ability to restore or restorative therapies that are not based on pharmaceuticals, not based on a lot of chemistry, but are based more on other types like transcranial magnetic stimulation, for instance. It's like, what? Which some of the operators and former military people get where they're getting a, a high pulsing of magnetic stimulation, which, which actually creates neuroplasticity. Really? Yeah. So again, Another topic we can chat about. Do, do, are you aware of any long-term effects from marijuana use? I think they're a bit varied depending on the age of the person, uh, but they do change brain waves positively in the beginning and then negatively as it's long-term. Really? How, yeah. What is long-term? What is long-term? I don't know. I don't know what their definition of that is. You know, it's. Uh, they don't say if that's a year or six months, five years. No, it, I, I haven't seen data for that. I'm sure it's probably there if you dig into that, like what do they consider long-term? But then again, what did the person bring to the party? Are they someone dealing with just mild, mild to moderate anxiety? Or is it somebody who has a military history with all of that trauma, physical brain trauma from injuries, you know, rounds going off, high, you know, all these high caliber, all that stuff coming together, toxin exposure, and they have anxiety. So those are two different people. Okay. So what's going to be chronic here? What's going to be chronic there? What's the dose they're going to need to get relief? What is that dose? That's a very unregulated area. That's part of the problem. It's like trial. Everyone's trying something to see what works. Hey, everybody. I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.